I think I'm particularly pleased to introduce Professor Kramer to India uh, in some ways. So he's probably most known for being a co-winner of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics, along with Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee for their experimental approach to development economics. So Esther and Abhijit probably are much better known in India. They come here much more often. Michael hasn't come here as much, though he does have a very highly cited paper on teacher and doctor absence that was done in India, uh, which happened also to be my first ever paper uh, when I worked as a grad student with that. And and interestingly, the director of the World Development Report under whom that was done was Shanta Devarajan, who gave the, the, the lecture last year. Um, so I think, you know, everybody can see the CV, but Michael's basically hit every distinguished academic milestone there is. He was an undergraduate at Harvard in social studies, PhD also at Harvard, started his faculty life at MIT, was then for many years the Gates Professor of Developing Societies at Harvard, and then recently moved to the University of Chicago as a university professor uh, with a broad, broad mandate uh, to work across the university. Um, I think, so, the, the great thing about Michael is while the experimental approach to development is what is known, there's another strand of Michael's work that is less well known, at least in India, which is his work on innovation. And the work on innovation, in some ways, is probably worthy of a second Nobel by itself in terms of the amount of contribution that has. So, you know, this, uh, this basic insight that the most important driver of long term human progress is technological progress is something that's well known to growth economists. And so, even though Michael's, a lot of his work has been micro development, his advisor was Robert. Barrow, and so it comes from a macro tradition as well of recognizing the importance of innovation. And I think the key connection between innovation and development is that most of the innovation in the world happens in high income societies because that's where you have the purchasing power to get the returns to the investments in R&D. And so Michael's done absolutely mm, uh, path-breaking work in making recommendations of how we can leverage the power of the market to generate and deliver innovation for low-income populations. And so the exemplar of this was the work on the advanced market commitments for vaccines, whereby you channel the creative energy of the private sector to kind of doing medical innovation for problems of the poor. Okay, so uh, the we, we do more farmers. You know, the truth is we got while we talk about vaccine inequality, the world got very lucky with COVID that this was a high income country disease that you had the entire R&D machinery of the high income societies that cracked this problem within a year. If this was just a low income country problem, we probably would have been waiting 10 years without a vaccine, okay? So, and so the power of kind of taking innovation and using that for low income populations is probably one of the most powerful ways in which we can stimulate global welfare. And I'm particularly delighted that Michael's lecture today will span both experiments and innovation. Uh, so I think the two other things I want to mention about Michael, which is quite unique and inspiring to me personally, is how much of a non-traditional academic he is in terms of being an entrepreneur in doing the downstream work of converting ideas into real world impact. So over the years, he has founded multiple nonprofits, starting with things like Deworm the World. Uh, he's set up the Development Innovation Ventures within USAID, was played an instrumental part in setting up Evidence Action, which again tried to scale up a bunch of evidence-based ideas, uh, set up the Global Innovation Fund, um, and all of this was basically trying to direct money towards innovation, towards evidence, in which Ways that would have the have the most uh, most impact. Uh, and then the last thing on a personal note, like in addition to, you know, there's a lot of very distinguished academics who spend most of their time writing their papers, but Michael was also a legendary advisor. Uh, and as my own advisor, I kind of feel I can share one particular story that kind of speaks to Michael's commitment to his students. And so, you know, this was literally the day before I had to, or I think three days before my job market packets had to be sent in November, and the last draft of my paper I'd sent to Michael for comments. And he was in a conference in Seattle and managed to print the paper in the airport, read the paper on the flight, mark it up completely, stop by my house from his cab from the airport to home, drop off the marked up draft at 10 in the evening, and kind of head home from there. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, that's the level of commitment over years, like, you know, Michael showed not just to research, but also to his students. And, you know, he's been a huge inspiration in my own life. In particular, there's this quote where there were times when I would feel great moments of insecurity that the academic economics profession in the US didn't fully value the amount of time I spent with policymakers because your incentive structure is just to write papers. And I think Michael famously said, you know, never apologize for the fact that your fundamental motivation is to make sure the 200 million kids in India have a better education and that economics is a tool to get you there and not an end in itself, okay? So, so Michael's been inspiring both in words and by example, and I'm, it's my great honor and pleasure uh, to present him to the IPF audience. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you for the very, uh, very kind introduction. Um, I, I appreciate it. Um, it's an honor to be here for the and to be selected for the sort of awesome lecture. Um, you know, I, I think the uh, the, diff, the attributes of economists in terms of different professions. Uh, Esther Duflo uh, uh, famously added uh, economist as plumber, um, and I, to some extent, I'll be talking about the economist as a participant in the innovation process uh, today. Um, thank you. So. Let me first start off uh, uh, on the on the somewhat uh, uh, inside the profession uh, uh, point of view, but I'll, I'll be really trying to focus uh, on on policy for most of the talk. But one way to you know when I when I first began doing experiments, um, I I mainly thought of them as a way to understand and isolate the causal impact of. Of particular programs or particular uh, uh, um, features of, a, of an environment, and then with the hope that perhaps that would yield lessons for policy. But the emphasis was really uh, initially for me on understanding causal impact. So let me, oh, uh, sorry, let me, it was on the wrong slide. Um, but, and I think that can indeed be an a, a important role of experiments. And you know, I think the case of deworming uh, that, that Karmtuk mentioned is a, is a good example of that. So you know, together with Ted Miguel, I was involved in work on collecting evidence on the impact of deworming. And you know, our initial work found that uh, this could quite very cost effectively increase school participation. Uh, we found that school absence fell by about a quarter. That um, we followed this with a, a, with other authors over the years, and it uh, followed the same group of school children, and it now looks as if they're earning about thirteen earning and cons consumptions both go up by about thirteen percent, thirteen fourteen percent. Um, that since deworming costs just pennies per per dose. And in fact, the medicine's often available for free. This makes it extremely cost-effective as an investment. And you know, I hope this has helped inform policy, including policy in India. Um, the you know, state governments began introducing deworming programs in 2011. And then in, uh, in, in 2015, the PM introduced national deworming days, uh, reaching and they now reach hundreds of millions of children annually. Um, so this is, a, the, I think this is an example of how you know, the causal evidence can be used to inform policy. There's uh, many other considerations which I'm skipping over here. Um, but I, I'm, I'd, I'd like, what I'd like to emphasize today is another uh, role, way, role of experiments, another way that um, that is in some ways much broader than uh, just understanding causal impact, and that I think is responsible for some of the impact of the experimental method. I think experiments, by their nature, involve the researcher in, in tackling specific problems, in working with implementing organizations, often in working with people with, from different disciplinary backgrounds, Often they can be structured in ways that give, that allow for fairly rapid iteration. So results come in from one experiment, maybe they're not what was initially ex uh, expected, or maybe they are, but, that, that, but there's some, some reason to then follow up to try to, whether it's to see whether the results generalize, whether it's to understand the mechanisms driving the results, whether it's to practically see if the same, a similar approach that's perhaps somewhat in, less expensive or more suitable to scaling uh, can have the same impact. So there's, there's often follow-up studies, um, or sometimes the initial results are very disappointing, and you try a different approach. And, that, and then there's often a sequence of studies after that, and that iterative approach, I think, um, uh, enables uh, that iterative approach with constant contact with practitioners and with other disciplines, I think, 
uh, has a, a has been responsible as at least as much as the uh, uh, isolation of causal impact uh, to the extent that you can do that for the impact of, of the experimental method. So I'll give some examples of this, but I think of experiments as uh, or uh, not as part of a uh, innovation cycle. Not that that's the only use of experiments, but often they, they can be. That often begins by identifying the issues through discussions with stakeholders and focus groups. You know, it's in, I've um, been told by anthropologists that um, the you know, economists often leave all that part out of their papers. But it's, in fact, a critical aspect of this approach, as any practitioner uh, using these techniques knows. And that, uh, the researcher gains a lot of insight from that. And that also, I hope, makes this, the, the work uh, more useful to, the, to practitioners. Then there's identification of candidate solutions. Um, and that's informed by, again, by discussions with stakeholders. Uh, but also by literature review of experience internationally. And you know, at that point then, there can be um, use of the experimental method um, to A-B test and refine solutions. And you know, that's, that's often itself repeated multiple times because the results are often not, not what, what, what one hopes for or what one necessarily expects. Um, and only at the end of I don't say at the end of that process, because uh, part of the point is that this is a cycle. But then eventually, there's scope for scaling things up. But of course, that just often leads to the next set of questions. Um, and um, so this is really a continual uh, process, ideally. So let me, with that, you know, let me, let me try to give a, a bit of a, a concrete example of that. So what I'd like to do in the, in the talk is give, um, I'll, I'll talk about information for farmers um, uh, and including some work in, in India, um, uh, not um, by, by uh, colleagues, um, um, as an example of that. And I'll talk about water quality, which is an area I've been working in recently. So those, those will be two examples to illustrate uh, what I'm getting at uh, with that previous slide. But I'd also like to talk about institutions, not just examples, but institutions to try to um, promote experimentation and, and innovation. A little bit different than the, uh, than the approach that Kartik was talking about, although I'm happy to discuss that in, in, in Q&A. Okay, so first example, in, information for farmers. So the, you know, across India, um, there is a very large scale effort to provide information on soil chemistry to farmers. And you know, why is that important? Well. You know, one, there are many reasons that's important. So farmers can you choose the right inputs for their farms. It also has, there, it's widely thought that farmers are overusing certain types of inputs, overusing fertilizer with you know, negative consequences for the, for the government's fiscal situation in a situation in which fertilizers are subsidized and negative environmental consequences. So if farmers knew which nutrients they need and which ones they don't, then at least in theory, they might be able to um, not only increase their profits, but produce fiscal benefits for the government and environmental benefits. So the government, or you know, multiple, you know, both at a central level and a state level, there's uh, efforts to provide uh, soil health information, soil chemistry information. The government of Gujarat collaborated with researchers, uh, um, to Sean Cole and Nilesh Fernando in particular, to test and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Garma as well, um, to test and refine designs of soil health carts. Now the initial designs that came out of the agriculture department, you know, they provided a lot of very detailed information. And you can imagine if you're in the agriculture department, you'll, know, you'll want to report on it as comprehensively as possible. But it turned out these were very difficult for farmers to, to understand. So uh, I, it's a separate Cole and Fernando paper. This is actually Cole and Sharma. Um, this is, um, so they used human-centered design approaches. They interviewed farmers. They did focus groups. 
tried to understand what the issues were. And then they, they came up with a simplified soil health card design to improve understanding. And you know, this picture will give you a sense of that, the color coding, you know, uh, was there, which nutrients were lacking. They also tried adding uh, audio, and they also tried video extension. There's also big trust issues around these as well. Um, and they found that improved comprehension tremendously by about 35 to 40 percentage points. Um, now that, and, and also that this, um, this improved trust uh, in the, uh, as well, and that it, um, so in other work, uh, Fishman has found 70% of farmers in Bihar don't trust the recommendations, for example. Um, so um, the, um, now this is something that, um, that, you know, it turns out that they, they also benchmark this against a, an actual agronomist having a, you know, personal conversation. And not surprisingly, it was best to have an agronomist there. We actually got very close with just audio, and so that audio message developed, delivered over mobile phones together with this improved design. You know, this is a little bit like Economist as Plumber, uh, because it's, maybe this isn't glamorous work thinking about how to redesign a, a soil health card, but it actually had tremendous impact. And I, I think it's part of a broader process of of uh, innovation in this area. Now, a key step uh, that I think remains, I don't want to claim that, okay, this is a, a success by itself. You know, there's, there's, you have to make sure that there's accurate information um, and, that there's, and that there's useful information. And, you know, ideally, there's scope to improve the quality of information as well, whether that's the soil chemistry information or providing uh, actionable, farmer-relevant uh, information on weather. So if you think about some of the work that Rosenzweig and Udre have done, suggest huge gains to farmers for more accurate weather forecasts. Well, we could, do, we could probably do a lot better in providing very localized information for farmers on that. And you know, all that information could, could potentially be delivered to farmers. Let me say a little bit about the, the um, you know, the reaction of the government to this. Um, um, the, the government actually proved extremely open to this, to this evidence. And I think that's actually characteristic. So I've been working with, uh, with Sean Cole and with others. Uh, we helped set up a, uh, a nonprofit organization called Precision Development. And we've seen this experience in country after country. Um, of openness to the results of evidence like this from working, working closely with, with partners. Um, we've seen this in Pakistan, we've seen it in Ethiopia, in Kenya. It, 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 we actually, um, it, you know, there's, it's very easy, and I, I don't want to claim there isn't reason for this, it's very easy to be cynical about governments, but I think at least in this environment, and this is not perhaps a politically uh, controversial issue, but when, when, when they saw the evidence, even though the initial designs from the governments in all of these contexts were not very accessible to farmers, if there was evidence on, on, on how, how you could produce uh, information that was more accessible to farmers, the governments were interested in using that. Okay. Let me, but let me uh, discuss a, a bit of evidence now that I was involved in um, from, uh, from other, other parts of the world, from East Africa, um, that I think is an important, uh, sheds light, at least some light, on a, another important question around this, which is, you know, while mobile phones create the potential for very low cost delivery of, of information and for information that can be delivered you know, agricultural extension systems, there's just not enough extension workers to reach everybody. Um, there, it's, it can be fairly high cost. Uh, there are all sorts of governance problems. Um, you know, mobile phones create a lot of opportunities. They also create opportunities to deliver the information in a very timely way. So to match the time in the agricultural season, to match a pest outbreak or, or an adverse weather effect, um, and to make that customizable, perhaps to the crops that people are using or or other aspects of, of people's of farmer situation. But you know, there are also grounds for skepticism. Farmers face a lot of barriers. Uh, they may have credit constraints. Uh, they may have problems with marketing. You know, how much are you going to achieve with this? Um, so here's some evidence 
uh, from a context in East Africa, where, or several contexts in East Africa, where we were able to uh, measure adoption of inputs because we were working with a, an input supplier uh, that worked at quite large scale, or, or a number of ones. Some of these relied on, on researcher design methods, but the largest studies uh, involved working with uh, 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 bodies that had administrative data on use of uh, on purchases of inputs. Okay, so as context, um, in this area, there's actually widespread consensus that uh, on certain inputs, uh, it's quite different situation than in India, often with underuse of inputs uh, relative to recommendations from governments, from the international experts, from NGOs. Um, one particular input, a lot of these studies are uh, in areas with acidic soils, and they are treating the soil with lime can help uh, improve, improve output. Okay. So the so this summarizes evidence from a number of different studies. This type of um, this type of diagram is a meta-analysis diagram, um, and it combines uh, combines data from different studies. Each row here represents one study. Um, the bars represent the confidence interval, and the diamond at the bottom summarizes the results from all of the studies. I'm happy to discuss that in more detail. But uh, this, the overall finding is that, you know, on average, this digital ag extension increased the odds of adopting recommended inputs by 22%. Now, this is from a low base. I don't want to argue this is a you know, transformative by itself. But if you judge this from the point of view of, of the benefit-cost ratio, because the mobile phone messages are so cheap, this, you know, we estimate, based on the agronomic estimates of the impact of Lyme, uh, a benefit-cost ratio of about 9 to 1. Okay. Um, I touched on the, uh, the, government, uh, the government response or, earlier. Um, and you know, just focusing in on India, you know, there, there are now many cases, or multiple cases, where uh, institutions within India have have uh, have have, uh, have have adopted things in part through this process of a collaboration between the governments, uh, researchers, and also uh, a, a nonprofit organization, uh, a Precision Development. Um, so the government of Odisha has uh, rolled out improved soil health cards with audio uh, messages. Uh, the Department of Agriculture and Farmers Empowerment is, is now reaching uh, over 2 million farmers. Um, the IFCO Kassan is reaching 3.5 million farmers across 19 states. Uh, the Coffee Board of India has been uh, has experimenting in, in Karnataka. They've really done this at some scale among coffee farmers um, uh, in, in Karnataka, and they're, they're hoping to roll this out much more broadly. Um, so, and I think, you know, why, why, um, why, why this collaboration? Well, while the governments are willing to respond to evidence, um, they don't always have the staff or the units de dedicated to experiment experimentation and iteration on this. So, I think there's a, a real role for collaborations in this, in this area. So, uh, uh, let me go on to a second example. Um, this is on water treatment. So I think this will combine you know, both, both elements that I've talked about, both the sort of evidence of impact, uh, uh, perhaps uh, feeding into policy or helping inform policy, but also the, um, the, the potential role as part of an ongoing process of, of iteration and innovation and iteration. So Jal Jivan mission is aims to give all households a, a functional household tap connection, uh, one that's actually delivering clean water. And you know, I wanted to discuss some new evidence suggesting very large child survival benefits from clean water. So again, this is a meta-analysis. Um, and you know, one, one thing to note about uh, water is because water's been 
you know, various technologies for treating water, in particular chlorination, have been around for a long time. There's not much of a private incentive, to pick up on, on what Kartik was saying, not much of a private incentive to do, you know, the companies will spend hundreds of millions of dollars testing a new drug that they have a patent on. Uh, but you can't get a patent on the basic idea of chlorination, maybe in a particular new device, perhaps, but that's easy to, to innovate around. Um, so there, the studies don't tend to be very large, and you know, because they're done with, uh, with much smaller amounts of money. And if you're trying to understand the impact on diarrhea, that's fine. Diarrhea is a pretty common outcome. You don't need a big sample size. If you're trying to understand the impact on child survival, then you need a huge sample size. But you can't get those financed, typically. Um, so the studies are, are powered for diarrhea, and health researchers take, uh, take the idea of pre-analysis plans uh, and just, uh, a limited set of, of uh, primary outcomes uh, very seriously. I'm doing multiple hypothesis testing if you have too many. And so there's actually a disincentive to report mortality as an outcome, because then you might have to do a multiple hypothesis testing, and you're, you know, you're underpowered for that outcome. Now, we did find a few, a few so we, what we did is we, we reviewed the literature. We found a few studies that reported this nonetheless in some sort of you know, table at the back of the article. Um, but then we wrote to all of the authors. And we ask them, do you have this data? Now, you know, often if you're doing a survey of diarrhea, you know, there's reasons to think that you have the, that they, they would often have this data. They're doing a survey of diarrhea. If, if the child has died and they, don't, they can't get an observation, they might have recorded that somewhere, you know, particularly if they're doing adverse uh, uh, event reporting. So we were able to get data for 15 studies, not all of them, um, um, but we got data for 15 studies, which are, are listed here. Uh, again, the bars represent the confidence interval. There are different sample sizes on this. Um, when you put all of the data from these 15 studies together, you can see an impact. You can see, you can measure the impact on child survival. Um, or here, it's expressed as the odds of, of, of child uh, mortality. And you know, this, the, at some level, um, actually, sorry, before I go, I, I say what the, the numbers were. You know, the previous evidence just on diarrhea, that was not enough for, you know, that was not enough for uh, water treatment to be prioritized within the health sector. Uh, so typically, you know, there are less of child uh, survival interventions, and those get some funding. Um, but this didn't get that type of uh, funding. And so often, around the world, uh, in low- and middle-income countries, water treatment isn't, isn't, uh, isn't prioritized. It doesn't receive that much funding. Well, you know, what we, there were, and there were reasons. You know, there, there are, I, I find it very intuitive that cleaner water would reduce deaths from diarrhea, which is a big killer. But there was debate about this. Um, uh, because there are other ways people can get, can get diarrhea. There's flies, there's uh, fecal, uh, other types of roots to fecal matter contamination. The effects we found were much larger than, than I expected, I think many in the field expected. Um, we found that the odds of, of, uh, of, of child death were, fell to zero point, fell by, they were 0 0.7 of what they were before. So a 30% reduction is on the average, for reasons I won't go into, that really corresponds to a 25% expected reduction in a new, in a new implementation. Um, and um, so that suggests that this is potentially what Jaljivan Mission is doing, what India is doing, is it, is, could have a huge potential impact on health. Now, delivering that impact will require not just, you know, these studies, I should, I should say, these are of water treatment. They're not of no water versus water. They're not of uh, having to go collect water somewhere else versus piped water. These are different types of water treatment, overwhelmingly chlorination, but some filtration studies. Um, the, um, now, most people are still using, or many people are still using untreated groundwater. 
And there's also recontamination of treated water. So if you're getting water through a pipe, but the pipe is only delivering water a few hours every day, well, the pressure in the, in the, if there are leaks in pipes all over the world, if you're in New York though, they're maintaining high pressure. So the leak, then the water from inside the pipe goes outside the pipe and you, know, you waste some water. But if you have low pressure some of the time, then, then things can seep into the pipes. So water from outside, that could include water with sewage in it, or it could just include water with dirt in it. Well, if that, that dirt then reacts with the chlorine, the reason why chlorine kills germs is it reacts with everything. If it reacts with the, um, with the dirt, then there's no chlorine left by the time it gets to the household tap. So finding a way to ensure that this, to make this, to go from sort of the uh, abstract finding that this potentially could improve health to actually improving health for millions of people requires a lot more work. Um, 70% of households in rural areas don't treat their water before drinking it. Um, so here are some approaches uh, that could potentially be used um, in India now that the Jajivan mission's in place. Um, one would be inline chlorination. So it's possible to attach a device to the pipe that the water is going through and to do that much closer to where the water is reaching the household. And just to, these are inexpensive devices, you know, $40, $50. Um, the, you, the chlorine tablets themselves are very inexpensive. You know, they might have to be, for if, you're, if the pipe's serving several hundred households in a village, maybe you replace it uh, uh, every, every week or so. Um, the, uh, um, there's a randomized trial of this approach in Bangladesh suggesting a 25% reduction in diarrhea. Um, but you do need effective systems to deliver the chlorine, uh, to monitor the refills, um, to monitor water quality, uh, at least in a sampling basis, and to ensure action to address any issues that come up. So all of this needs to be, systems for all of this need to be worked out. You know, another approach that I've been involved in is coupon systems to deliver a uh, water treatment solution to women with young children. So that's typically delivered through the health system and might be in a situation where very few people have access to, to chlorinated water. Um, there's household, uh, you know, small bottles of water, of water treatment solution for household use. And that can be delivered uh, when, when uh, women are coming in for antenatal visits, uh, for, for prenatal visits, for immunization for their children. Uh, they could get coupons for water treatment solution. And we've done a couple, or I, I was involved in one RCT of that, there's another one. Um, and it, it's, it's been found to be, not all households are gonna use household water treatment solution, but it's, it, this coupon approach targets those who do very well. So it's because it targets households with young children, and because it targets people are actually gonna use uh, chlorine, um, it, it's, um, it's, it's quite cost effective. Okay. So those are two examples of, of how, how experimentation can, and can have an impact on policy and how it can have an impact in policy in particular when used as in close collaborate, when there's close collaboration between researchers and the implementers and that's done on an ongoing basis through, through a, um, uh, allowing iteration. So let me, let me move on to the, the, the issue of institutionalizing this process because there, there, I've given you some ad hoc uh, examples, but um, you know, this, I think if there's a need for trying to try to systematically create more of these innovations. And by looking at some early examples to, of institutionalizing this. Um, we'll also be able to, uh, rather than cherry picking some examples, and instead of talking about the failures, of which there are many, uh, we'll be able to try to assess the track record. Um, and also maybe learn some lessons about how to set up uh, funding mechanisms for this. So you know, there are different types of institutions that have been set up. You know, one broad class is government innovation units. So uh, the Experimental Policy Initiative in Chile set up a, um, a 
believe through their, through their finance uh, process, uh, finance ministry process. Uh, the State Innovation Fund in Tamil Nadu as a collaboration between JPAL and the government of, of Tamil Nadu. There are nudge units, and, and I believe they start in the UK, in the US, they're in India. These often focus on improvements to get, trying out potential improvements to government policy, and they, they try to rigorously measure their impact. And so this is focusing on innovations that are developed within the government, although often with collaboration from researchers. You know, another approach, uh, a very related approach, is uh, tiered evidence-based innovation funds. Um, so one that I've been involved in uh, is development innovation ventures within USAID. Um, I, I was involved in, in helping set that up and I continue to be involved as scientific director. So I'll, I'll present some data from that, but uh, I'm, not a, I'm, uh, I, I'm not a totally neutral party. Right? Um, another one was just recently set up. Uh, France set up the Fund for Innovation and Development, which Esther Duflo is, uh, is playing a leading role in. Um, so these are open across sectors and across applicant type. So it's not just ideas coming from the government, but go ideas coming from you know, firms, from nonprofits, uh, from, from social entrepreneurs, from, uh, and from researchers. And um, certainly in DIV, we're open both to ideas that would scale commercially, but also ideas that would scale through public support. And you know, how, do you, how do you make any decisions given that openness across sectors and across uh, scaling methods? Well, we, try to, we have a tiered approach. There are small amounts of funds for piloting, because you don't want to start with a randomized control trial. Uh, first, you have to do that, that initial discussion with stakeholders, focus groups, trying out ideas on a very small small scale. Um, but So we'll provide those pilot funding. Then there's larger, you know, larger but still modest uh, uh, funding for rigorously testing ideas. And, you know, the nature of that testing will vary depending on the, on the, on the situation, but often it's through uh, the experimental method. And then the Larger funding is reserved for things that have rigorous evidence of impact and cost effectiveness, or the pass a market test and the uh, test of market viability for things that would scale commercially. Um, you, you may, you know, if you've got a solar device that's selling, you know, a lot of these companies will claim that it's going to improve test scores of the kids because they'll study more. You know, but if people are paying for it, uh, and they're paying the full cost, you know, that's probably enough to think this is a good idea. Okay, so, um, so let me present some evidence on the impact. We've been around for, uh, just had our 10th anniversary a, a little while ago. So, you know, some innovations take decades to scale, or certainly to reach their full scale. Um, and there often is this process of trial and error and a lot of innovation, and, uh, of iteration and things changing. But here's some some evidence that we thought it was worthwhile trying to look at our early portfolio from our first you know, two and a half years and look at what the track record was. And what you find, the first thing to notice is the shape of this graph. You know, as if, as if, when you're funding any innovation, you know, the majority of things fail. I don't want to say fail, but uh, you know, some of these uh, that look very small here had, had significant impact. But the, the maybe a more a uh, more positive way of putting this is the, a small fraction of the innovations account for the majority of impact. And you know, if you're a venture capital investor, you know, if you invest in Google or Facebook, you're happy even if you know, nine of your other investments didn't have that type of return. So this is just measuring the number of people reached. Now, we want to try and do better and get some sense of, is this a good investment? Now, for that, you know, that's very difficult. Some of these, it's hard to quantify the, the benefit uh, because of things like voter report cards. Uh, actually, the two biggest here were both in India. Uh, voter rec report card uh, project that uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Rohini Pandey were involved in. With it. Um, and, uh, but the biggest was software for community health workers uh, that, that, uh, where most of the people reached were in India. And the, um, but we couldn't, you know, either there were conceptual problems quantifying the benefits, or there were just uh, practical problems. The data, the innovation that was scaled differed enough from the uh, innovation that was tested 
that uh, you know, we couldn't uh, make, make, uh, make assume that the impact was the same, for example. Okay, so the, we were able to, we only tried to innovate the nine innovations that reached more than a million people. By the way, you know, nine out of, out of uh, 41 uh, uh, innovations is actually a fantastic record relative to the, to the general, uh, um, to the industry. I'll come back to that in a minute. But, um, but we, we quantified five of those nine, and the ones in red. Okay. We tried to do that pretty conservatively. So we funded um, we, uh, 40, uh, 43 awards to 41 innovations, I believe. Anyway, the social benefits of just five of those, um, we calculated, you know, with, again, with uh, conservative discounting rules, uh, 17 times greater than the cost of the total portfolio. So that's obviously a lower bound. It suggests you know, very, very high potential returns from this approach. So uh, I, you know, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm very happy about France's decision to, to launch one of these, and I think there's scope for more of them in, in development, but probably in a variety of other fields. Let me say a little bit about some evidence on you know, which innovation scale and a potential theory of why these might make sense. So um, one predictor was the unit cost. If the unit cost was, we had a much higher rate of scaling. These are very small samples, bivariate uh, analysis. But the unit cost being less than $3 was uh, a very strong predictor. Um, there were, there, it wasn't a you know, perfect predictor, some things scaled that cost more. But if you're trying to produce something for the poor, whether it's for individual consumers or for governments, you've got to keep it pretty cheap. Second one, I think is almost a corollary, that you know, a lot of entrepreneurs think about selling things to consumers. But a lot of businesses out there sell to other businesses or sell to governments. And the customer acquisition costs, if you're selling something for under $3, you know, even modest customer acquisition costs are going to make this a very, very tough to run a commercial business like this. So most of the things that reach scale had a, a, a model of selling either to, to large existing organizations, either you know, typically large businesses or governments. Uh, some, uh, and then you know, one finding, and perhaps this is where I'm most, uh, you know, most prone to, um, to bias, um, is there's a lot of, in the sort of social entrepreneurship world, there's a lot of debate about what's the role of randomized controlled trials, of researcher involvement. You know, many people see this as slowing the process down. What we found instead was that things were much more likely to scale you know, if a researcher was involved. And this was... You know, this was a surprise to the extent, again, the, the, I thought that it wasn't going to be bad, but I had no, no, no idea that the effect would be this strong. And you know, we don't know the reasons for this. These are correlations. But let me suggest one hypothesis, which is that you know, in many other sectors, if you're thinking about whether innovations will scale, you, know, you, think, it's, you think it's fairly natural that researchers would be involved. In biotech, you would think that. In computer science, you would, you know, the idea that a firm would be founded by graduate students and then would go on to scale, you know, that doesn't seem crazy. Um, um, but I think that um, in economics, you know, obviously the profession is and should include lots of people doing very different things, including lots of uh, straight research things that are are going, you know, theory and uh, other types of empirical work and macro, but and even obviously within randomized trials, there are people who are really focused on understanding the mechanisms and improving our understanding, not on innovation, and that's completely appropriate. But there's now some subsectors of economics, not just in development economics, but actually you know, there are theorists who work on matching problems where they're really working in a in a sustained way with implementers. Um, and are iterating over time. And you know, parts of our profession are becoming more like other fields where it's an accepted role of 
uh, of, of the researchers to also be trying to develop things that will have practical impact. Um, and you know, this suggests that maybe we're, we're getting better at it. Okay, so let me just ask, you know, raise a, a, you know, a paradox here. You know, as this is a government, you know, USAID is part of the US government. You know, there's all sorts of rules in the US government as there need to be, uh, but um, you know, it's not always the most nimble. Some of you may have applied. By the way, if you haven't applied, if you have an idea and you want to apply to DIV, please, please apply. Um, but, um, but it takes time and it's not, and you know, you need to write a proposal and, and so on um, because it's a government procurement system. So, you know, why, how can the, how can the government be successful in this area? So a hypothesis would be that commercial investors leave arbitrage opportunities for social investors um, where there's low ex-ante private returns but high social returns. And there are certain things that as, as, as economists we know will contribute to this. So if you think about um, barriers, to, you know, to just give a few examples, if you think about barriers to entry, you know, Warren Buffett says you want a moat. You want it so that the innovator you're backing once they establish their, their business, it's hard for others to enter. That's great if you're a commercial investor. You, know, you want to invest in the Google or the Facebook that will have some, some market power. Now, on the other hand, if you're a social investor and you invest in an idea and there's no moat, so a bunch of other firms come in and copy it, well, that's fantastic um, from a social point of view. Um, so that's a difference in what's, what a private investor and what a social investor will be. Or think about the case where the potential customer for the innovation is a government or some other organization with monopsony power. Well, if you have a single buyer, they're probably not going to let the innovator keep a lot of the returns. And, you know, the, and they may decide, hey, we'll just do this ourselves or we'll get some other supplier. Um, that's not a good investment for a private investor, but it might well be a good investment for a social investor. And in fact, um, you know, if I go back to this chart, the software for community health workers, this was a private firm. The private firm, you know, the vast majority of people they reached was in India, where the government of India was rolling this out to all community health workers. But India just decided uh, you know, I, um, to switch to another supplier which is you know, um, totally understandable. Um, I mean, I have no opinion on which firm had the better technology, but um, that's, that, that, that doesn't, you know, the innovation from a social point of view, this is, that's, that's, not a, that's not a problem at all. For this firm, turned out, I assumed it was a problem for them, but I asked them, and they said, you know, actually we weren't making that much money there anyway because the government of India was not paying more than it needed to, of course. Uh, um, so this suggests, I think, just points to the different, somewhat different roles of, uh, of a venture, private venture capital firm trying to maximize commercial return and a social investor. I think that has, has implications for the design of these programs and you know, both for investment decisions where there's likely to be um, socially valuable investment opportunities and where you won't be crowding out the private sector, but you'll actually be additional to them. And also, you know, where you might be getting a lemon, because if the private sectors, if private investors have passed on this, you know, does that mean that this is a bad idea, or does this just mean that it's, it's not going to be commercially viable? Okay, let me skip this slide. Um, and, um, um, you know, just to, to say a few concluding words, I think there, the, you know, I think this suggests that one of the things that can be done with the experimental method, and I, I really do want to reemphasize this, just one of them, is to try to produce practical innovations. And I think that's a, you know, one legitimate use of this, uh, of this approach. I think that that's, in, while there are some cases where you're just producing the evidence and then presenting that evidence to policymakers is the appropriate role, I think there are other cases where sustained, ongoing, collaborations and working together to iterate can produce, uh, I think, both better understanding of the world, but also practical innovations for the world. And I think there's a role for 
governments to create institutions, and you know, more experimentation with those is, is needed. But I think the existing, you know, albeit imperfect evidence, suggests that these can be have very high social return, and that, and perhaps give some insight on why there can be a high social return, and, and perhaps on how to structure them. And um, um, I, I, um, I think this is an area where more work is needed. It's it's tricky because the returns are very skewed, so you can't judge this on an individual and a sort of a gotcha basis of, I you know, one side cites the most successful example, another side side cites a string of failures. You really need to, you really need to, uh, bring, do this on a portfolio basis, which you know, takes a while. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Kramer, for that wonderful talk. Would you like to yes. come and sit down here? Oops, sorry. I hope I didn't spill the hand. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is my first opportunity, so before it's opened up for Q&A, let me thank NCAR for having shown me the honor by having invited me to come and chair this wonderful, wonderful session. As has been mentioned before, we have a trinity here in some sense. We have NCAER, we have TN Sinivasan, and of course we have Michael Kramer. NCAER, as you know, in case you don't know, you now know because it's all over the place, was set up in 1956 not under the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1956, let me assure you. I have always wondered, and I've asked Poonam Gupta's predecessors, and they don't know the answer to this question, I've always asked, why was it called the National Council of Applied Economic Research and not the National Council for Applied Economic Research? which is what it has been doing down the years. NCR has a wonderful, wonderful tradition of working with data, working with numbers, working with statistics. So it was quite different from uh, an academic institute that pontificates at 30,000 feet above the sky. So let me take this opportunity to congratulate and say ER for having initiated that India, this India Policy Forum and for this T.N. Srinivasan Memorial Lecture. T.N. Srinivasan, and again it has been mentioned and everyone here already also knows, was always interested in empirical work, policy-related work, and this is not just Bhagwati and Srinivasan. I don't know how many people here remember that shortly after the reforms of 1991 were introduced, for a short while, Department of Economic Affairs started a series of working papers, and there was one brought out in 93, I think, by Bhagavati and Srinivasan deliberately to float an idea, and what was that idea in 1993? to liberalize imports of consumer goods. And I'm just flagging this to illustrate that both Bhagavati and Srinivasan have worked, have always worked on policy-related issues. In 1956, we are also talking about poverty. In 1956, I don't think anyone here remembers except Surjit Bhalla. In 1956, uh, Bardhan and um, Srinivasan uh, did a collection in Sankhya, 56, mind you, on measuring poverty and income distributions. And the third part, and, and if you notice, look at the names of people who have delivered this particular memorial lecture before. Uh, I knew about the first two initially, and I thought NCAR was fixated on the name Pranab, but uh, <laughs> Anta Devarajan proved me wrong. And all, all four, including Professor Kramer here, have worked on empirical stuff, empirical being broadly used. And of course, we have Michael Kramer, 
He's been introduced. We need no further introduction. The talk itself was a wonderful, wonderful introduction. I have two questions for you just to set the ball rolling, nothing more than that. And maybe if it's fine by you, we should collect some questions and then you can answer them before we gather some more. By the way, when you ask questions, please do remember that it is Professor Kramer who's delivering the lecture you want. <laughs> so please, please try to keep your questions brief because typically a long question always warrants a short answer. So if you want a long answer, keep your question short and preferably not make it, make it a comment. I have two questions for you, both in terms of uh, your cross-country experiences, not so much India. One is if the benefit-cost ratios are so high, why is it so very difficult to get many of these initiatives going? Is it because the benefits are more difficult to measure and quantify? Is it that the benefits are staggered over time, whereas the costs are immediate? So what is your sense on the basis of the cross-country experience? Secondly, nudge units, digital innovation labs, how robust has their success been? Have they been around long enough for one to be able to judge whether they've been robust? Floor's open. Um. Can you were giving evidence on, on what makes for successful projects, and that seems really, really exciting. Um, I wonder if you could talk about what makes for successful partnerships with government. Mm -hmm. how, to, how to identify the right partners for scaling up these projects. Okay, yes. Yeah. This mic is not working. The mic is not working. Many people are academics. They know how to raise their voices. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. Um, Bina Agarwal. Um, I, um, uh, I had a question on your uh, farmer's uh, extension, mobile, use of mobile phones for extension information. Um, so you have 3.5 million. Uh, so I have three short questions um, related to that. Firstly, did you disaggregate these by caste and gender um, and region? How are they spread out? Uh, because we know that mobile phones are very unequally distributed and owned uh, by both caste and gender. The second is that, you know, farmers share information. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you give information to Sonal Desai, who's sitting next to me, then there's a good likelihood that she'll share it with me. So did you do clusters or did you use networks? I mean, have you, have you also tried out um, networks of farmers so that you didn't have to kind of bombard the information to a whole set of people who know each other? And the third is, have you thought of um, sharing information with groups? So, so for instance, especially for women uh, farmers, uh, self-help groups could be a, a potential way to uh, reduce the inequalities which might arise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, right at the back there. Do you mind if I move the glass? I'm not stealing it. It just makes it easier for people to see you. <laughs> Sounds We're good. Excited. Hi, Professor Kramer. This is Rahul Aluwalia. Um, true economic cost is opportunity cost, right? Like, so if you're looking at a cost-benefit ratio, um, what, for instance, is the opportunity cost of government instead focusing on shifting institutional architecture towards economic growth, right? Which also has benefits uh, that are very widespread. So how would you think about that, the opportunity cost of focusing on innovations versus uh, growth? Shall we take one more? Yeah. Sure. One more and then, yes, right there at the back. Yeah, the mics are weak, I think. Yeah, I'm Shekhar from Institute of Economic Growth. You have spoken about the collaboration between researchers and implementers. So, uh, uh, how do you think that will impact, or rather, uh, affect the uh, assessment of the impact? Will it bias the assessment of impact in any way or the other? Hmm. Okay, do you want to? Sure. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for these, these great uh, uh, questions. Um, so, 
Um, so first question was, you know, why, why is this hard? Um, I, I think you're, I'm, I'm sure you're right that the uh, delayed benefits relative to the, to the, uh, to, to the say, political horizons is a factor. Um, so I, a, you know, I think this might also help address the question about robustness. Uh, uh, so there is quite a big literature on the returns to investment in innovation. Tarun, uh, you know, it's great to be it's a nice symmetry of of, uh, of picking up on some of the some topics from Tarun's talk at the beginning of the conference. Uh, and Tarun cited some some estimates. Uh, but I've, uh, those were even higher than the ones I was familiar with. But it's quite common to get sort of, uh, for investment in scientific research, to get estimates of sort of returns like 70%. Uh, um, uh, and you know, whether that's the older Zvi Grolikas type estimates on agricultural research or estimates of returns to health research. Uh, we have less, much less I mean, on data on two other types, which is this was you know, the results I was talking about we're trying to make a contribution to. One is the returns to uh, social innovations. Uh, so there are a lot of efforts that, you know, uh, if you think about uh, the Omidyar Fund, for example, they're supporting lots of social entrepreneurs out there. And um, we have less evidence on that. And we, I think we also have less evidence on, on uh, social science uh, uh, research like uh, um, like uh, social science experiments. So this is a, a first attempt to get at those two because DIV funded both. Um, I think it's encouraging, but there's plenty of room for, for a, a need for further research on this. Um, but to return to the, you know, the initial question about, about why there isn't more, you know, why, is, why are governments letting this opportunity for 70% rate of return on basic scientific research go unexploited? Why aren't they driving that down to, to 10%? Well, I think your, your hypothesis that part of this is, is, uh, is the time horizons. When politicians have, you know, they're worried about the next election, that could be part of it. Uh, the, but I also think that um, part of it is that there weren't, this is a fairly new field, uh, the, at least certainly the, I think both sort of social entrepreneurship has really taken off recently, and social experimentation in social sciences, uh, well, obviously in some areas of social science, it goes back a long way. In, in development economics, it's fairly, fairly you know, it's, it's not that old. So I think it takes time to conceive of and try these new innovations. And I guess I'm somewhat encouraged by um, the fairly rapid adoption, as you say, of, of, of nudge units uh, recently, of, uh, of the French decision to set up uh, uh, the Fund for Innovation and Development. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm somewhat encouraged. Um, okay. Um, okay. On the, um, on the question of what makes for a successful partnership, well, let me start with what makes for an unsuccessful partnership. Um, uh, you know, I feel that the approach that a lot of funding institutions have of, well, everything we fund needs to be evaluated and needs to have a randomized control trial, which it certainly does, you know, not everything needs a randomized control trial. And, but just in terms of a successful partnership, well, if the funder is saying, you have to do this and you have to collaborate with somebody, that's not a formula for success. This has to be something that where both sides want to go into it based on their core interests as uh, you know, the organization has to see this as something that they want to do. And, and that's why I think this model of collaboration designed around the problems facing the, yes, we want evaluations to know the returns, but you know, innovations around the practical problems the organization has identified that it's facing is often a great way to to get started, and then you know once that relationship exists, well then maybe you know new ideas start coming in from the researcher. Once the researcher has some some idea of of, of what's uh, what the situation is on the ground, what would be of interest to the organization, um, but um, so I think it takes a lot of goodwill on both sides. Uh, you know I had the. 
uh, ple pleasure earlier in this visit of, of doing an event um, um, with Rukmini Banerjee from Pratam, who's uh, been working with, uh, with researchers for a very long time as a practitioner. Um, and you know, one of the points she made, which I've heard her make before, is you know, she's not always, you know, yes, there's the RCT evidence and the paper which comes out five years later, but you know, there's just a lot of practical benefits of, you know, if you're hanging out with Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, you're gonna get a bunch of interesting ideas and you're getting a bunch of process data along the way. And sometimes that process data really uh, informs things, total or the baseline data, uh, independently of the RCT evidence. So, uh, uh, so um, uh, okay, let me t uh, take a couple of other uh, points. Um, you know, on, on uh, digital information for farmers, um, so, these were, I've been involved in some studies elsewhere in the world. I wasn't directly involved in the studies in, in India, but I was, I'm involved in the or, an organization which uh, uh, I collaborate close, I'm involved in the organization which was involved in these, and I, I collaborate closely with some of the people who were. I know that the, um, so let me say one area off the bat where I know that the, the balance is bad, which is gender. Um, you know, uh, men have more access to phones. Um, now, unfortunately, that's true for a lot of in-person extension work as well, and arguably might be even worse in the case of a lot of traditional agricultural extension. Um, I, I know that the organization Precision Development is, is working to try to find ways to improve that. I think the idea of working with uh, with, you know, often there are women's organizations, and I know that some, you know, I, I, I might be misunderstanding, but my understanding from discussions with the government, uh, 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 with somebody from, from uh, Odisha, from the government, is actually uh, 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 um, not in the state government, but he's, he's from uh, Odisha. Um, uh, it was that um, the government there has provided a lot of actually phones to self-help groups, uh, women's self-help groups. So that might, I think that's an excellent idea to try to, to, try to uh, improve outreach. We definitely, from my own research, we know that there is spillover. So those 22% numbers I gave are in some ways a lower bound. They were from, um, I won't go through the details of that. Uh, on the issue of, but happy to talk afterwards, on opportunity cost, you know, I think the issues of economic growth are obviously vitally important. Uh, I think you know, this was a good investment of government funds in the sense that it seemed to have a very high benefit cost ratio. I do think that it's very important to, um, to uh, I don't want to, this to be misinterpreted, you know, thinking about issues of, of a trade policy, of, of, of uh, credit policy, uh, just to mention a couple of things that have come up in, in this conference are vitally important, and um, you know, I, 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 uh, I know Matt Rabin, the behavioral economist, and you know, he's, he definitely thinks textbooks should be starting off with the, uh, the things that are currently in textbooks, and then you can introduce behavioral things later. So uh, he does his own research on, on behavioral economics, so I, I, I don't want to take any emphasis away from, the, uh, from you know, what the key lessons of of economics are that I think, uh, um, and I think that there's a lot of ways ex the experimental approach can contribute and can be very useful. But you know, obviously, the basic insights of economics on uh, on on you know, a range of questions around economic growth are very important. I do also think that there's a role for um, a role for experiments in trying to understand some of the drivers of economic growth and the drivers of macroeconomics. And, um, um, and I'll, I'll point, for example, to the work of Supreet Kaur, who's, who's, you know, her work on wage rigidity, even on, in villages, um, you know, that's something that helps us understand, that's an important input into, into a lot of macroeconomic models. Or at a different level, um, you know, some of the work um, um, that Ahmed and, and, and Dave Atkin have been do doing on trade policy, using experiments to shed light on do firms, is there actually learning by getting into the export business? And 
you know, understanding that's very important for understanding trade policy, and, and that's really some of the, the best evidence that we have on that. So these are effects that were often pretty hard to find. I mean, tell me if I've got this wrong, but I, I, I understand they're pretty hard to find using other approaches, and, and uh, this is some of the best evidence for them. So I, I, um, I, I think we need a lot of, we need a bunch of methods, but I think uh, experiments can also help to understand some, some uh, some issues around economic growth. Yes. Sorry, this is the last question on conflict of interest or independence when you partner with them. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I'll come back to that in the next one. But you want to also? Oh, I can. There was one unanswered. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had to flip over my. Uh, uh, the, the issue of. The, I'll, do, why don't I, I'll just well, answer uh, that, that, that just first. Just one second. Uh, uh, um, the, you know, the last question was on um, does this collaboration cause. Uh, you know, potential conflict of interest in, in reporting. Does that lead to bias in the reporting? So, you know, I think the, I think one, uh, that requires the longer answers than we have time for, but let me just throw out a few reflections. Um, one is that I think one nice thing about the experimental method is that it, it somewhat ties the hands of the researchers. I don't want to claim that it perfectly ties the hands of the researchers, but uh, because there are always choices that have to be made, and that's inevitable. But I think there's less scope for, for discretion. But of course, you know, it's important to have a bunch of institutions around that as well. Now, the health research world is an area where you know, billions of dollars are, are, are rest on the results of, of uh, drug trials, for example. And they have a quite rigid set of rules, as might well be appropriate for them. I think in, but you know, in some ways, I, the water example illustrated some of the downsides of too rigid a set of rules. Now, I think we need institutional innovation to try to come up with the appropriate sets of rules. Uh, clearly, disclosure is, is part of that, and that's why I wanted to disclose the link to DIV. But if I, you know, I'll just throw out one example. One thing that I think would be useful to get the benefits of, of, uh, of registration, of you know, committing to what the outcomes are going to be in advance, um, and, but while also getting the, the, avoiding the cost of people not reporting potentially very important outcomes that might later go into a meta-analysis, would be, so if I can propose my own institutional uh, innovation, and this would require a lot more thought, but uh, to work out the details, would be to allow researchers to say, hey, here's what my primary outcomes for this study. Here are some other outcomes that I know I'm not powered for, and I'm, but I'm gonna report those as well so that they can go into a meta-analysis later. And I think that some reform along those lines might be able to, to get better outcomes. But we'll need to do that on a, on a host of issues uh, to try to address these questions. And sorry, if I can just you know, yes. uh, take a, I think one, one 30 second addition to that is there's definitely publication bias, right? I mean, towards finding positive effects. But I think a recent meta-analysis showed that RCTs are the least prone to publication bias. So, you know, in your typical OLS regression, I mean, we know, right, you can pick your controls and get whatever result you want. And there's a reason we've moved to experiments, right, which is in the 80s, we were writing papers like, I just ran 2 million regressions, or let's take the con out of econometrics. So I think in, in that sense, the good news is that I have seen at least that Journals are willing to publish zeros, right? I mean, so even if the effects are, are, are zero, as long as the experiment is well done, right? So the Journal of Development Economics now has these pre-registered um, uh, commitments to publish. They say they kind of, they accept the paper based on the design, regardless of the result. So I think, you know, we're starting to see some innovations and experiments, I think, are less prone to the file draw problem, and we're publishing a lot more zeros increasingly. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Kemar, Manish Sabarwal, I work in employment and education. I, I believe in experiments and evidence, and, but I would love to hear from you a response to the criticism I mean, from the horse's mouth. Well, not horse's mouth, that's a bad aphorism, <laughs> from your mouth. <laughs> that, that, that RCTs are not generalizable, they're not scalable, they're not replicable, and it's just physics envy, right? It's the social sciences having envy of of the physical sciences. So I would love to hear your take on it, because obviously evidence matters, obviously experiments matter, but 
it, it keeps coming back and in many cases it's true, right? It's not replicable, it's not generalizable, it's not scalable. Maybe that's not a valid criticism, that wasn't the objective to be generalizable, scalable and replicable, but would love to hear your sort of response to that criticism. The mathification of economics. Okay, just behind Swami. I'm Swaminathan Ayer of the Times of India. If there are some projects which have an enormous social return, but there are political hurdles, problems of uh, inertia, that you can't get it growing. It's not one solution that an institution like the World Bank or the Gates Foundation offer a large outright grant for any state government, or have a competition between state governments on the first three state governments to accept it. We'll get this large cash grant and to make sure that it's properly done, say the cash grant will be at the end of the program and not at the beginning of the program. Would this not be a way of uh, bridging the problem between private incentives and social, social good? So that was a question. You weren't testing your next column. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Neeraj Kaushal from Columbia University. You had uh, talked about what are the cases where, what are the criteria that innovation scale up uh, you talked about the cost of this uh, innovation is less, and then you also said uh, if it has an R RCT. Uh, my question is, uh, do these, uh, after the innovations are scaled up, what is the effectiveness of those innovations? And does that have a long-term impact on scaling up further? Yes. One, two, and then the next round, I guess. Um, yeah. I just, uh, I'm Sonal Desai, uh, NCER and University of Maryland. I just want to pile on to Manish Sabarwal's question. For a country like India, uh, which is highly politically and culturally diverse, do you have recommendations on designing experiments that could be scaled up? Yes, I saw a hand there. Yeah. Two rows. Hi, I'm uh, Sudhan Shu and I have a small uh, body consulting firm. The ideas you suggested about the farmer uh, improving the yield and uh, the crop, as well as the water supply, I was thinking there's a lot of alignment of incentives for the, in case of the farmer, for the customer, that is the buyer, to have a good product with lesser pesticides or uh, any kind of, um, sorry, chemicals in the food and the sourcing to do the uh, due diligence for their clients, say organic food and stuff. So why, have you seen any case studies that uh, where they have funded the um, uh, betterment of the farmer's life and his yield of the fields? That's a part A. And part B, uh, any other case studies where the utilities have taken an initiative to ensure the pipe water is safe to their clients, because that's also something that helps them out. Great. Let me uh, take some of these. Yes, uh, um, so, yeah, the, on the concern that the results of randomized trials might not be generalizable or scalable or, or replicable, um, yeah, I think the question to which, of the extent to which uh, randomized trials uh, generalize is really, I don't think there's anything special about randomized trials in that way. I think this is a general issue with empirical work. If, you, if you're studying uh, empirical, uh, if you use non-experimental techniques to, you know, to understand, say, difference in difference techniques or, or other techniques to understand the impact of a policy in a particular place, you know, will that be the same elsewhere? We don't know. At some deep philosophical level, we don't know. Um, so I think it's, it's, I'm, it's, it's, at some level, this is a, I don't see this as a criticism of the experimental approach. Rather, it's just a general issue with any empirical work. But you know, we make judgments uh, with empirical work in general, and I think it, it it's better to do empirical work than not. Um, but I also think that there are empirical things one can do to assess the extent to which it generalizes. 
will never understand. You know, I'm not a philosopher. I'm like, uh, I'm like There is one uh, in uh, Chicago with your same name. Okay. Um, um, but uh, but uh, so so uh, I won't try to tackle the deep philosophical issues around that. But um, but the um, um, but the but just at a purely empirical level, you know, we're now in a situation where we actually have evidence. I put up two meta-analysis diagrams. And one of the things you can do with the meta-analysis is test uh, not just the average effect, but test how much dispersion and effect there is across contexts. And I think it's, you know, now with a limited number of studies, the statistical power for those tests might not be very strong. But so here's, I'm not going to cite numbers to you, but I'll just give an, an, my own observation from you know, writing some analyses in, in education. You know, one thing at least I would speculate on is that I do a lot of work on, on Kenya. You know, there's a lot of work done in India. I felt like a lot of the work on the st student, you know, are what, what affects whether students are going to school, on student learning. There was a lot of similarities between these two contexts, which were very different. Not just those two, but you know, more generally. Some of the other things that rela related to provider behavior, well, there the provider is embedded in a very different incentive system in different contexts. So I, my, my impression, without doing any statistical tests, at the time I wrote the survey, and it was, you know, pre, it was before I got excited about meta-analysis, uh, so um, it um, was that there was maybe more dispersion across contexts there. Um, um, the, um, but I do think that we can, I, I think it's helpful to move away from sort of, uh, well, the philosophical, the philosophers will need to continue discussing the philosophical questions. But I think, you know, if we recognize that this is part of a much broader uh, issue, then it's, it's helpful to say, well, let's try to get empirical approaches to trying to assess this and trying to deal with it. So, you know, one paper I like on this issue is, a uh, paper by Udry and Rosenzweig, which says, you know, if you're evaluating certainly in agricultural innovation, you know, the effects not just in a different place might be different, in a different year they might be different because the weather might be different. And you know, what works in agriculture one year won't work another year. Uh, but they actually suggest some practical approaches. Well, how can, you, how can you try to design your study to try and get at the, or at least shed some light on what, what the variation might be um, and, and incorporate that. You know, the, the, um, you know, this very much relates to the, to, the, uh, to the question about the diversity of India. And you know, I think there are some things that might be very common across India, but there might be other things in terms of the results of randomized trials. There might be other things that are very different. And they might be that you can predict that, say you know, there are systematic differences between the north and the south, or richer regions or poorer regions, there might be some things that are difficult to predict. The way, you know, what, the ideal way, this isn't cheap, is to design the experiment so it takes place in multiple sites, and then to look, to do a meta-analysis, to say are the effects different across sites and what predicts the differences across sites. Uh, you can either do that within one trial, uh, if you've got a big enough budget, or we can accumulate evidence over time uh, through as, as, as more and more studies are conducted. Um, okay. On the, the issue of political ob objections, um, um, you know, I, I think the, so you know, the idea of rewarding a, a specific policy, obviously, you know, that different people will have different views on that. Uh, you know, some people might approve of the policy and like that idea. Some people might disapprove of it or disapprove of, you know, if we're thinking about the World Bank doing this, of external, you know, too much external influence or something like that. Um, um, I won't, again, I'm going to steer clear of the philosophical questions just to note that they're there. Um, but let me, um, let me say something that I think is very warranted and where there's a clear case in, in economics, uh, I won't say independent of ideology, nothing's independent of ideology, but a clear case for subsidies to a local region. And that is, 
not necessarily for adopting a particular solution, which there may or may not be. Again, I'm not going to take a stand on that. But on generating you know, the information that's generated by trying new things is a public good. And so I think if a low, you know, whether it's a state, whether it's a city, whether it's a, a particular you know, department within a university, if somebody is willing to try a new approach and carefully document the impacts of that, either with a formal experiment or otherwise, I think there should be support at a, at a central level for encouraging that type of experimentation, documenting it, and, and you know, conveying the results in an understandable way uh, to others so that we can, we can, because that really is a global public good. Um, um, okay. On the particular question of water supply, you know, I, I don't know the, the details of this, but obviously the problem of, of paddy uh, cultivation with the, you know, the, the, uh, with the electricity subsidies, the water use, uh, the water depletion, first order problem for India. I think this is, uh, um, uh, and for many other areas, uh, uh, not where I, my home is Kansas, which is real water uh, depletion. Um, so trying to understand, um, you know, when I was last in Kansas, they were actually doing some very interesting experiments with different forms of governance. Um, um, but I think trying to, you know, really try a bunch of approaches to addressing this. Look, there's some fundamental, you know, again, I'm not going to take a stand on, uh, I mean, as an economist, I probably, you can, you know, I'm inclined to think that, uh, um, that you know, when you subsidize things, you get more of it, and, and so, but I'm not gonna take a stand on a, on a political issue in India regarding uh, uh, you know, electricity subsidies, but I do think that there's, there's a bunch of interesting ideas and some work going on that uh, um, we were just discussing on, in uh, Punjab, is that right? Mm -hmm. on, on ways of restructuring things so the farmers still get the electricity subsidies, but they, it's, the form is converted so that if they save water, it's sort of a cap and trade type system. And if they save water relative to where they were, they would get, uh, they would get rewarded for that. So ideas like that, ideas like the idea in Kansas of local, of allowing people to form local uh, water associations that could then regulate use. You know, there are a bunch of ideas. I think trying them, trying to get evidence on them is, is, uh, is really worthwhile. Uh, also on utilities, and uh, how, how to you know, monitor them. I know the Jaljeevan mission is trying to include a lot of monitoring as part of that. Uh, I think you know, figuring out how to do that is, is very valuable. Can I say two things? Yes. Just quickly. Um, so I'll just take uh, 30 seconds, one to respond to Manish, and second to give an example of something Michael's talking about. So I think this question about what do we learn from the studies, I think there was an early wave of RCTs where I said, oh, this works and scale. But I think we've moved beyond that, right, to kind of saying, to focus on principles of what are we learning across these studies. So to give you an example from education, see, we've now done seven different RCTs in multiple countries to say that simply find giving schools extra money, for the most part, has no impact, right? Now, and this is then work that was cited in Esther and Abhijit part of the Nobel, which is kind of finding that the binding constraint to learning was the kids are so far behind the curriculum that if I'm throwing money at you, textbooks, teachers, nothing matters because you're not alleviating the binding constraints. I think that's then an example of not saying, here's an intervention, you scale this up, but you kind of you know, you really take the principles across all of this and saying, what have we learned? Because education policy, for the most part, is still increase the budgets, right? Increase the budgets, and most of that goes into things that don't work. So I think that's kind of one answer. I want to give an example of kind of something Michael talked about, just to illustrate how powerful this is. I think it addresses something Bibek also said, that if these returns are so high, why is it not happening? So the example I'm going to give you is from a study we've done under a partnership with the government of Tamil Nadu, with JPAL, that set up exactly this kind of innovation unit. So the planning department basically put 50 crores and made it available to any line department that wanted to pilot and test an idea, and they would kind of make the money available for a study. Right? And now, the, the, that the study we did was the simplest one. So ICDS activists have, for over 20 years, been asking for a second worker in the ICDS, okay? So people who are on the ground working on child development know that you've got this one ICDS worker who's dealing with both preschool health and education, and this is, you know, there's just too much work. So the idea has been there. Finance departments have never made the money for it. 
World Bank, when there was a World Bank project in the 80s, the government of Tamil Nadu did it. The moment the money stopped, the intervention stopped. So all we did under this partnership was the department said, you know, we have been quite keen to evaluate this. Um, we evaluated this and found that the return on investment was 20 times, right? I mean, so you get huge effects, not just on learning outcomes, but also reduction in child malnutrition because of the time saving of the existing work. So then that's now evidence. Now, of course, going back to Sonal's question about external validity, this is still Tamil Nadu, right? There's no guarantee this is going to work in UPR behind. Maharashtra, but we're now in conversations with both WCD and Niti Aayog and others to take that evidence and saying, how do we do now multiple phase trials in other settings? And so that's then an example that's very local, but this is this so much low hanging fruit that we estimate these returns are 20 times the cost, but we're not doing it. And part of what the evidence does is puts these ideas on the radar to then hopefully kind of make happen. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for that. And, you know, just to give another example of commonality across very different contexts, you know, across different parts of the world, um, um, uh, particularly in, in, in low and middle income countries, um, there's been a finding that, provide, that many kids are falling behind in school and that, um, and that, that makes it that, and that providing extra support to children who've fallen behind or teaching at the right level um, can make a huge difference. And so Pratam, as, as, a, as a non-profit organization, as an NGO, has done a lot of that work in, in India, but the government is, is also doing, doing a, a huge amount. Um, and you know, similar approaches have been found to, to be very effective in, in many other contexts as well, including in, in Kenya, where, I, where I've done uh, done some research myself along these lines. So I do think there are a lot of commonalities that, that are, are emerging. Okay, about 20 minutes for sunrise, for sunset, and you cannot get thirsty for another 20 minutes. So another round of questions, last round. Yes, yeah, Surjit, I saw Surjit first. Thank you, Surjit Bhalla. Um, <clears throat> you know, type one and type two errors. So could you explain or what was some of the spectacular errors that good old ordinary least squares had led to in terms of policy? Uh, what, are there any errors that RCT has led to in terms of policy, ex post obviously, it looks good, etc. Mm -hmm. And third, with the COVID experience over the last two and a half years, were there any RCTs on whether X worked or Y worked, masks worked, did not work, and what have the, did, has some policy on COVID been affected, which is spectacularly right? Has some policy on COVID been affected, which has been spectacularly wrong? Yeah, just, just the row in front of him. Yeah. Yeah, Ruchi Agarwal, also same institution as Dr. Bhalla, IMF. Uh, question for Michael. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, today we talked a lot about development, ec India and development economics. Do you think uh, there is sufficient study in the international community on India as a labor economy, India as a macro economy, India and trade? And if not, what can elders in the field like you do to shift and broaden the discussion of the study of India uh, as a maturing economy with complexities beyond just uh, on poverty and development. Yeah. Right at the back. Rohini Somanathan. Um, hi, Michael. It seemed that there was some... Can you hold the mic a bit closer, please? Yeah. Uh, there seems to be some tension between using experiments to estimate impact and using experiments for innovation, uh, especially when one tries to bring, out, bring about institutional change. So on the one hand, it seemed to be that you're working with an organization, you're learning collectively, you're inching towards a good solution. And when you do that, you hardly ever can then publish this as a as an experiment which estimates impact because you really want to start with a clean slate. And in the work that you've been doing on water and soil, um, have you experienced this tension and how do you deal with it? Uh, as a social entrepreneur yourself, 
uh, you know, you have these two hats. One is as a social entrepreneur and one is as a researcher. And, you know, what, what advice do you have? Because at one level you seem to have, you know, you can have large impact for particular organizations. On the other, you know, you get a message out to the world, but then you don't necessarily start off with the best experiment because you haven't done that learning and innovation along the way. Yes. And here. Hi, Abhinav Motheram. I work here at NCER. A uh, quick question and a comment on the, now that we have, pub now I think Karthik's comment on... Can you hold the mic closer? Yeah, I was saying uh, on Karthik's comment on now that we are now publishing more zeros, zero impact study. So I was just wondering, so... Don't uh, ask Karthik questions. Yes, of course. You can do that it was a more, Yes, it was more a follow-up question on RCTs and the empirical method. So, so what are the cost-benefit analysis of publishing more zeros and staying committed to a certain method versus uh, being more flexible with the methods. And uh, so it seems like the incentives would lead you to a situation where you have lots of studies with zero impacts. So just one. Okay. If it's a comment, oh, so if it's a comment, you are free to ignore it. Okay. I saw another hand here. Yes. Yeah, uh, I am Shourav Sharkar. I teach at uh, the Delhi School of Economics. So uh, I have <laughs> just a question that in this, uh, so you introduced us to a wonderful literature on uh, develop economists as promoting innovation, etc. So uh, can you give? <laughs> it will be nice if you can give uh, two to three, maybe or few research works which is useful for me to teach to graduate students. It's important for them to know, to, to get introduced to the literature. It's very nice. Some papers. Uh, OK, last question. Yes. The right has been curiously silent. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Professor. So, uh, Sanskriti this side. So, I'm actually an analyst and a fresher within the economics field. So I've been exploring economics and law as an intersection. So my concern was, given the partnership question we had, to just have an extension to the legalities when we have a partnership with governments, with the cross-country perspective we have, what would be your take on the bureaucracy level or the red, red tapism which would hinder such partnerships? So in your experience. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Um, well, let me tackle uh, 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 both Rushir's question and the, the question type one or two uh, uh, errors and errors from RCTs uh, together. So, I, you know, one question was, you know, India is uh, large and complicated and rapidly growing economy, and you know, there are a bunch of questions of macroeconomic policy, of trade policy, of, uh, of, uh, of competition policy, um, labor policy. Um, and you know, I do think that, um, and I think more needs to be done on those. And you know, I, I do think one, you know, I tend to, to be, and I'll, I'll include, uh, you know, I, I tend to be focusing on a lot of social sector and a lot of work that you know, Kartik has done and been, has been on the social sector. And I think uh, this is not quite the answer to the to the downsides of of uh, and w the mistakes int introduced by by our cities and the as was originally intended. But I think one thing that I think we need to do as a field is and which you know Kartik is doing on a, and a lot of his work on on. You know, government government effectiveness is to sort of broaden our ambitions a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of the things I worked on, uh, you know, when I first got into this, I, I was you know very deliberately wanted to steer clear of uh, controversial areas, and so worked on things like deworming, which you know when you get down to the micro aspects is big controversies between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health about who's going to do it and implementation, but at least it's not. 
uh, quite as controversial as some, some other issues. But I think, um, I think we do need to, to broaden things out. Now, people are increasingly doing this, as, as I've discussed, but I think we've, we've got a long way to, to go further. And you know, to some extent, it does take more creativity to figure out ways to do that. Um, so, so we should be doing that. Um, the you know, there's another sense about the type one and type two R, which is, you know, any, you know, any intellectual efforts. Again, I would say it's not limited to RCTs, but it definitely includes RCTs. It includes empirical work. It also includes theory. You know, we're going to come up with ideas that are not good ideas, um, and or we're going to falsely reject ideas that are, are um, that we, we shouldn't reject. Um, so, you know, we haven't had that long in development economics to know. So, probably 50 years from now, we're going to point to a lot of uh, many more. It'll be easier to give a lot of concrete cases. But let me let me actually say what I think is one case that I discussed today. Um, you know, I discussed the case of, of water, and I said that there was a lot of, there's, you know, in a test tube, you can, you know, the, the germs are killed. You can see that the diarrhea rates go down. That's not perfect because it's caregiver reported diarrhea rates, and there's biases in caregiver reports, and they might, in fact, there's reason to believe, and got some work on this myself, that the mere act of measuring diarrhea changes not just how people report, but actually changes their practices because it makes them um, more aware of the issue. So totally understand why, uh, you know, I, people in economics think of me as a randomista sometimes. Uh, I think, you know, compared to people in medicine, every economist is extremely structural uh, uh, person. Um, you know, there are people in medicine who are like, hey, that is not good enough. We don't, you know, the test tube evidence, the basic scientific channels that they understand much better than we do in economics, um, the, uh, and the, you know, the RCT with not the perfect outcome, you know, wasn't enough. And they did it, and in part, you know, because of the, what I will say is an over-reliance on RCT evidence, uh, which we in economics are maybe haven't quite got to that point yet, but I think in, sometimes in health it can be there because precisely, you know, they have strong institutions uh, about this, but maybe overly strong, overly rigid um, um, in some cases. Maybe they're necessary, I don't want to, but, uh, um, but that did prevent, I think, funds from going into water treatment when it should have. I don't think, you know, now we feel like we've made some progress with this meta-analysis, but Suppose we couldn't have done that. You know, I still think it would have, how can it be harmful to, you know, it's, it's got to be worth it to, and, you know, most, the countries in the world, the high income countries are all chlorinating, have been doing so for 100 years. You know, doing this is not a, that's a call that should have been decided as cost effective uh, based on the, without RCT evidence. So I'd, I'd hate to get into a situation where I think sometimes in medicine, there's too much, too much insistence on that, and I'd hate to get there in, in economics. Um, um, okay. Um, okay. Um, tension between estimating impact and innovation. You know, I, well, so one side of that was raised earlier, which is if you get very involved in innovation, maybe you're not objective and you focus on the, the positive results because you're committed to your innovation and, you know, there are, I, I do think that we need institutions and economics to try and control that. And uh, I think I would hate to say, here I feel like the funders sometimes go overboard. Um, the funders often say, well, we need a separate implementer and evaluator, and we need an arm's length relationship with them. I would argue there are big gains from actually close collaboration. And you'd be throwing out the baby if the bathwater if you say everything has to start with that. But maybe once you've got evidence of something, then you want to get extra tests, and maybe you do want to at least involve some other researchers in those. Uh, you know, we, we have to think about that more, but I would hate to go to draconian solutions uh, to that. But you're raising another issue, which was, um, does this create a barrier to publishing? And I did argue this is sort of ideally a long and 
a, a sustained process with multiple iterations and not all of those, and the focus groups and, and all of this, you know, that does take a lot of time. And you know, I realize for some people that may be, um, yeah, they've got to publish, they've got to publish quickly. Um, um, you know, I, um, I guess I would say um, that a lot of people have shown that it is possible to do this type of work and to, to, um, to, to be academically successful. Um, but I, you know, I also understand if people want a portfolio to combine different types of research, um, uh, particularly if they're you know, a graduate student, it's, it's risky to do an RCT. And uh, I think that's a, a decision everybody you know, has to make um, the, uh, as a researcher. Um, okay. Um, issue of zero, you know, a lot of studies are going to have zero impact. And, uh, and that's yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a, good a good thing. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the way the world is. Um, and we need lots of shots and goals to come up with, with uh, you know, ideas that, that have impact. But also understanding the zero impact, it's very important to know. Um, um, papers to teach, you know, happy to, to take that up offline. But, uh, um, um, and uh, I think economics and law is a very, you know, that's a great example of thinking a little bit outside the comfort zone. Um, there, you know, I think there's very interesting work being done on ways to address um, um, court systems that are overloaded to try and get courts to move more quickly. Um, and you know, I think there can be other areas of economics and law. What's the effect of providing representation to people who don't? What's the effect of this? Uh, I, you know, that, there's been some work on each of those. I'd love to see more work on you know, can you get, what are the incentive effects of trying to provide, uh, you know, let's say, um, you know, there's representation for workers in, in, uh, for, in cases against employers where maybe they have, uh, have weak protection right now. Does that actually lead to better, better in, employers to start act, proactively acting uh, in, way, in complying with the law more? Uh, to begin with. There are a bunch, of, a bunch of very interesting questions in law and economics that I think you know, with creative designs could be explored. So thank you very much uh, for this, I think, you know, excellent talk and the discussion that we had. There's a long list of people that we have to really thank uh, who have been responsible for preparation uh, of of this uh, conference and the work that goes behind you know, the organization of the conference. But I, first I'll start with all the authors, the chairs and discussants, uh, and of course you know, the two eminent speakers, both Professor uh, Ann Krieger and Professor Michael Kremer. Um, then of course you know, the participating <coughs> research and advisory panel members who could really make it and participated in the sessions that we held on the two days. And all the participants, of course, you know, without the participation of large number of people, the conf conference uh, is really meaningless. Uh, and I also want to really thank, of course, you know, the four uh, governing body members um, who have been you know, there throughout the two days, and in particular, both Dr. Balla and Mr. Manish Sabrabal. So that shows the commitment that, uh, the, to the work that we are really doing. So thank you very, very, very much. And in terms of the people who have been responsible for this, uh, for the organization of the event, I'll start with thanking uh, Mr. Manish, uh, Mr. Abhishek Chaturvedi, and two of his colleagues, Ms. Aditi Agrawal and Ms. Sanchita Kapoor, who really, you know, kept a, a, an eye on all of us and kept you know, everything going on track. So I want to really start, thanking, uh, start with thanking them. And then we have um, Ms. Anupama Mehta, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Jagbir Punia, and Ritwik Kinra, who really worked hard in bringing out the, the volume of the papers that were presented at the IPF last year. And of course, and also, uh, you know, getting the uh, papers for this year's, uh, this year's uh, conference. Then, of course, we have uh, Ms. Sudesh Bala and uh, Ms. Khushwinder Kaur, 
who was really helped by, who were helped by Ms. Sadhana Singh and Shashi Singh in the secretarial assistance. Uh, Dr. Sonal Desai, Dr. Gornali Bhandari, and Shilpi Tripathi for the social media and for the Twitter, for the tweets. Mr. Rakesh Srivastava, Praveen Sachdeva, Mr. Rajendra Lenka, and Mr. Ritesh Tripathi for their IT support. Mr. Piyush Gupta, uh, Mr. Girish Kulbe, P.P. Joshi, Mr. Lange, Mr. Ravish Kumar, and Mr. Vipin for their logistical support. And of course, you know, the three young colleagues who have been through with, the, with us, Ms. Kavya Singh, Aisha Ahmed, and Abhinav Tyagi. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank Ms. Pandey. Uh, 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 you've already done that. But of course, you know, thank uh, both uh, Dr. Bibek Debroy. I call him professor because, you know, when I started knowing him, he was at IFT, so I know him. I call him as Professor uh, Bibek Debroy and Professor Michael Kramer, who agreed to our request. And we came to this lecture. Uh, Mr. Rajinder Pawar for, you know, welcoming the, uh, the chair and the uh, and Professor Michael today, and of course, Karthik uh, Murli Dharan. Uh, <laughs> uh, Praveen Krishna, and of course, Dr. Gupta, who are the original creators of this year's conference. So, thank you very, very much for all of that.